we've been, on Sunday evenings, we've been going through the, uh, what is the church? And um, today, uh, we're going to look at uh, a to topic that we don't really speak on uh, very often in the church, and we're going to look at the eldership. So far, we've looked at a number of different um, things about the church. We've, we've looked at how God's, uh, the church is God's divine institution. God has um, implemented the church. Uh, it's been founded and, and built by, by Christ Jesus. It's been purchased with His own blood. Its uh, purpose is heaven sent and heaven bound. Uh, the head of the church, uh, Jesus, He's the authority and He is the head of the church. A church is God's obedient family. How we are when we come together, we are God's family. We are the body of Christ, His faithful, obedient believers. And also, the Bible uh, tells us about elders have been appointed by God, uh, qualified men to serve, um, to watch over the souls, to lead the flock, to shepherd the flock. So that's what we're going to look at at today, and there's a few different scriptures we're going to be looking at, looking at. Elders have been pointed by God. It's very vital that each and every one of us understand that we have a responsibility to our elders here at this congregation. Um, they, they are not above us. Um, they, they, do, they are not to uh, rule over us, to lord over us, but they are to lead us. And we are, as each individual member here, we are to look to them and to respect them and to be submissive uh, to them and to trust in their leadership over us. And so um, tonight we're going to look at that for the next uh, tw uh, 20 minutes or so. First of all, let's look at uh, the definition of an elder, God's definition of, of an elder. You know, the re religious world, when we look at their, they call their preachers of the denominations that they will call them uh, pastors. You know, I've been called a, past, a pastor by a number of people here in Ripon at the Ripon Coffee House that I go to. Um, I don't get into that with them. Uh, I don't like to be called that, but I understand that that's how they view the, the ministers of congregations as uh, the pastor. Um, elders carry a title as pastor, um, as bishop, as a shepherd, and of course as an elder. These are all of the same office, but as we look at each one, um, there's little different aspects of the work in the church of each one. An elder basically means a man of, of maturity, uh, a, a development, uh, stability, uh, wise. Not just a man of, of many years as, as, um, as uh, some of the... Uh, he's not a, it's not just a man of, uh, of many years. Um, a young man who has never been married. Uh, you know, there's... there's um, bodies out there, there's uh, denominations out there, they will call young men elders, and a lot of these young men don't even look like they're old enough to shave, but they call them an elder, you know, and it's just because they, they just don't understand uh, the biblical definition of an elder. And so um, a bishop is basically an overseer, and that's what an elder is. Uh, he plans and he, he directs the church. I know we don't call our elders here bishops, but they're elders, they're bishops. Um, also, the other word, pastor, it's in nearly uh, the same definition as a shepherd, and both are defined to have care and oversight of the members of the congregation. Uh, in Titus 1, uh, verse 5, the Bible says, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. In 1 Timothy chapter uh, 3, 1 through 8, uh, Paul mentions uh, these, these uh, words, bishop, elder, and overseer. overseer. And also, in those uh, seven verses of 1 Timothy uh, chapter 3, it gives the qualifications of an elder that we're going to go over more thoroughly in a little bit. But starting in verse 3, it, it, it is a trustworthy statement, if any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work. He desires to do. Verse 2, an overseer then must be above reproach. And we're going to go into that a little bit more. Um, but, you know, I, I encourage the, the young men. I encourage the deacons. Um, you have to aspire, but I encourage you to start thinking about the eldership. It may, it may be five, ten years down the road, but Paul talks about it's a very 
uh, wonderful work. I know there's a lot of headaches that come with that, and I know our elders have been through a lot that we, we don't understand. But it's something that is a great, a great, it's not just you do it for the title. You know, if you love souls, then it's something you might want to start thinking about now. Titus 1, chapter, chapter 1, verses 6, uh, 6 through 9. Uh, the bishop must be the husband of one wife. He must be blameless. He must be a steward of God. Not self-willed, not a novice. Have faithful children, etc. So the Bible teaches... Also, that God has delegated authority to elders. Yes, the elders have a great authority in the church. Webster defines authority as the power to influence or command thought, opinion, or behavior. So when we look at the eldership, the eldership is a body of spiritually qualified men charged with the oversight of the local congregation. There is to be a plurality plurality of elders in every congregation as we just looked at in Titus chapter 1 verse 5. He tells him to go appoint elders. He doesn't say point an elder here and there. He says to appoint elders. That means more than one. You know, there's, there's, there's congregations of the Lord's church that are huge that have 10 elders or have more. You know, but a mature congregation is one that has qualified elders. I know there's small bodies of Christ out there that, and I'm not saying anything bad about them, that they don't have qualified men yet, and they could be, um, they're scriptural churches, they're doing their best, and they're not considered mature, though, until they have elders appointed. Each congregation is autonomous from uh, other congregations. Elders have the oversight only of its members, and so they're not to be getting in the business of the other uh, congregations. Their authority is also not of themselves. Uh, through the body of Christ, God appoints elders. Elders are not lawmaker, lawmakers of the congregation. Elders are not to be uh, totalitarian rulers of the church. They are not to lord over the church, like I said earlier. But the eldership is such a very, very important office of the church. You know, James Garfield was the 20th president of the United States, and he was a member of the church, and he was also an elder of the church, and it shows you how important being an elder was to him, to how he knew, because when he was elected president, he stepped down as, the, um, as an elder over that congregation. God's word has given elders the authority to make the necessary decisions in order to accomplish very important tasks, and duties of the church. Turn your Bibles to uh, Acts chapter 20. Elders are to be overseers of a congregation. Verse 28, Paul writes, Be on God for yourselves. And, all, and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. There's that word, that Greek word, episkopos. And he says, overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. When we look at Thayer's Greek lexicon on page 243, it states an overseer is a man charged with the duty of seeing that the things done by others are done rightly. Therefore, elders have delegated, God has delegated authority to elders to make sure that the members of the church are doing what is right in God's sight. Also, we see here that there's a shepherd of the flock, of the scripture we just read. Look at also, um, turn, turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5, starting verse 1, Peter writes, Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, as a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. 
And then he says, there's that word, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight. There's that word, oversight. Not under compulsion, not vo um, uh, but voluntarily. Uh, so they're not forced to, for the office. They have to uh, aspire the office according to the will of God and not for sordid of gain, but with eagerness. And then he says in verse 3, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to the charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And as when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive unfading crown of glory. It's very important uh, words here to sh um, that shows uh, the authority of an elder. First of all, he talks about feeding, right? To feed the church of God. Also in 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, verse 2 here. Thayer's uh, lexicon in uh, page 527, it says, to feed, to tend the flock, keep sheep, to rule, govern, to furnish uh, pasturage or food. So elders have the authority to feed, to rule, to govern, to provide pasturage for the members of the church. That's spiritual food for the church. And then another word is watch. Same word in Acts chapter 20, verse 31. Therefore, watch. They watch over our souls. Now let's look at Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. It says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Do this with joy. Yeah, Thayer's... A Greek lexicon in page 127 defines this as to watch, to give uh, strict attention to, be cautious, active. Elders have the authority to do whatever is necessary in watching over the flock, watching over our souls. They are to protect us from destruction. And then to spiritually rule over the local congregation, 1 Thessalonians chapter uh, 5, verse 12 through 14, and also in the passage that we just read in, in Hebrews 13, 17. Also in Thayer's, in page 276, it defines this as to lead, to go before, to rule, command, and to have authority over. So elders have authority to rule over the church. Anyone who rebels against an elder who is doing God's work, is, is rebelling against God. And we must remember that. And then that word steward, Titus uh, 1 verse 7, it says, for a bishop or for an overseer that your translation may state, must be blameless as a steward of God. And this definition here in Thayer's in page 440, it says, the matter of a household or of a household affairs, a superintendent. Elders have the authority to carry out a duty to manage and superintend the affairs of God's house. Only in the local congregation, of course, is which they have this oversight. And then in the word submit, that word means to yield. Christians are to yield, to submit to the elders. And also in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. So number three, God has given... Uh, qualifications for our elders. And these qualifications are in 1 Timothy chapter 3. So why don't you turn over to 1 Timothy 3. Starting verse uh, 1 here in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Paul writes, it is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. 
An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, uncontentious, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how, we t- how will he take care of the church of God? And not a convert, at least he become conceited and fall into the condemnation and cured by the devil. And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church so that he may not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. See, Paul starts out with the, the foundational characteristic. He says that word, aspire. They must aspire the office that we just read in verse 1. The word aspire from the Greek means a goal work, working or preparing oneself for. It, it means to strive, to, to seek for, to reach for. Later Paul says that the elder desires to do the work. And of course Paul calls this a fine work. The one that aspires, he's the one who's going to study the qualifications. He learns what he is to do and how he is to act and to react uh, to situations. Paul then is going to break down the remaining characteristics into two categories. So the first category, Paul writes about personal spirituality, discipline and maturity of the elder in verses 2 and 3. And of course, these traits are non-negotiable. He must possess these. Well, why is that? Because it is God's house that we are talking about. It is His rules on who serves and what they need to possess to be elders of God's house. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. So let's look at that first one, above reproach. Above reproach, this serves as a basis for the remaining qualifications. He must be above reproach on all of the remaining qualifications. They are all built upon this one thing. If he's not above reproach, all those other ones are not going to matter. Nobody has an accusation against this elder, these elders that that are above reproach. They are blameless. So let's, let's look at the qualifications. Qualification one, to be the husband of one wife. The the Greek states, the Greek means that to be a one-woman man. He he is not to be a womanizer. He's dedicated to his wife, to one woman. And then he goes in and he talks about to being temperate on the second qualification. Being temperate is being balanced. It's being even keeled. And then prudent, number three, not rash, not impulsive. Number four, to be respectable, to have good behavior. This is the same word used in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, about a woman, about her um, carrying herself, about her outward appearance, to keep herself well-groomed. Qualification qualification number five is to be hospitable, to love strangers, willing to care for others, even those they don't know, to be kind, have kindness. They, they, They have a sacrificial spirit about them. This is the one who others can look up to and who could follow, they could trust. And then number six is apt to teach, able to teach. This is a skill that he's able to teach the congregation. And you know, if you think about this, they do not have to be a J.W. McGarvey or a guy in Woods or a Wayne Jackson. They don't have to be that to, to be able to teach. I know an elder who well, um, of a congregation, and he teaches. But he, he, he won't bring up any, any um, and you don't have to. I'm not saying the Greek words and things like that. He'll just teach the Bible when he teaches. He'll just get up there and he'll teach the Word of God. But there's a little bit more than the teaching, right? They must exhort with sound doctrine. Of course, that's all of us who teach, right? Wayne talked about uh, teachers in... Um, in uh, James 3, you know, they will have a stricter judgment. But the elders have to be able to exhort with sound doctrine. They are, need to be able to rebuke those who contradict the word. 
to be able to defend God's word, Titus chapter 1 and verse 9. And then qualification number 7, and not addicted to wine. They're not to be involved with intoxicating drink. Their minds are to be as pure as the driven snow. Qualification number eight, not pugnacious, not violent. You know, I had to look up these words and I had to look in my notes because a lot of these words are too big for me. But pugnacious, you know, to, uh, to be nonviolent, to not be a, a bully, to not be confrontational. And there is members of the church that are confrontational, that we, it's human, human nature. But elders are not supposed to, we're not supposed to be that, but elders are not supposed to be that. And then how are they, must be, uh, qualification nine, they must be uh, gentle. They must carry themselves with a soft voice to be gracious. They know how to treat people. Number ten, peaceable, not contentious. Not argumentative, not one who likes to debate. They're a peacemaker. Number 11, free from the love of money. See, they're not to be like a Judas, John chapter 12, verse 6. Judas wasn't concerned about the poor. He was a thief. The elders aren't to be guilty of greed. They're not to show themselves to be materialistic, to self-indulge. See, when I look at these qualifications, I see four of our elders that meet these qualifications. And we are very, very blessed at this congregation here to have these shepherds of the flock. Now, the second category is they're able to lead and work with others. And under this, there's three different areas. There's the family, his family, and then there's his church family, and then those who are outside the church. First of all, his family, verse 4. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. Manage stands before. He leads. He directs the rules in his house. 1 Timothy 5.17 uses that same word. And when you look at household, it, you know, we live in a different world than they did in those days. You know, their household consisted of a mom and dad and kids and, and grandparents and uh, aunts and uncles all the way down to their goats. And of course it was determined by the space they had and, and the finances they had. But they ruled their household well. They're not abusive. They do so in a nice way. They, they, they treat their family fairly. They exercise discipline. They, they lay down the rules that are to be followed and expect them to be followed. They know the proper way to handle them in the situation. See, their children are going to be uh, in subjection. The children are going to be obedient, especially when, when they see that they're leading them with love and they're leading with discipline and they're being treated with dignity and they're being treated with class. They're going to want to obey them. They're not going to strive against them because of how they are led. Uh, number two, the church. Well, we, we first look into a man's household. And why do we look into a man's household? Because how he rules the church. If, if, if we look into a man's household and he doesn't rule his household well, then how is he going to rule the church? Is he going to rule the church well? If he does not invest in his wife and kids, he will not invest in the body of Christ. See, God expects good strong, trustworthy, disciplined, loving men to be the shepherds of his flock. He leads his family in godliness. He keeps his children under control with all dignity. The rest of verse 5 says, But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? So we could see how he rules his house and how he's going to uh, rule over the church. And then verse 6, it says the new babe in Christ, right? He cannot be an elder. Why can't a new babe be an elder? See, he, does, he doesn't have the experience. He doesn't have the wisdom. He's in his immaturity. And he gets pointed as an elder somewhere. He's going to be puffed up. 
He's not going to know how to use that power and that authority. He's going to misuse that. And then those outside the church. We see that, that word must. It's the same word that's used in verse 2. They must be above reproach. A man outside of the church, when he is away from his brethren, when he comes in to, to the, the church of God, to the, to the body of Christ, and we're all together, and we could leave the church, and we could be somewhere, and we can act like a totally different person, can't we? And so they need to be able to be seen by those others out there as the same person that we see here. It, it doesn't change when they leave this building, when they leave the body of Christ. He has to act the same. He has to walk in diligence. He has to walk in these same qualifications. They have to look at this person and say, wow. You know, even the people out there in, in, our, um, in our jobs or wherever we go, when we, our family, our friends that aren't members of the church, they are going to know what kind of person you are, aren't they? They're going to know. And they're also going to know if you're playing an act away from your church. If you're around your brethren and they're there and they say, well, they don't act that way when I'm with them. <laughs> they're watching us. They know what kind of people we are out there. So they need to be talked to. If we're going to be appointing an elder, we need to know how that elder or that supposed elder is going to be outside of the congregation. Others, know, others who know them know. Okay, and God's elders are not perfect. We must never forget that elders are human beings, right? Elders make mistakes. Elders sometimes uh, fall in these sin. And sometimes they may not represent one or many of these characteristics as they are human. And we must always remember that. We are to respect them. We are to pray for them and help them in their service to lead, leading over us. I love what John Gibson said about this, about our elders. That's how I feel about our elders. I know you will too. He says, I have a great love for elders, and for the most part, I think that they are the hardest working and least appreciated of any group I know. They are men who have been screened under the, the exacting standards of 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, and have proven themselves over a period of years to those who know them best, brothers and sisters in Christ. Elders are not perfect. They have faults and weaknesses like the rest of us, but I am convinced that they have fewer of them than most of us. The ones I know are humble dedicated men, earnestly striving to do the will of God and praying constantly for wisdom from above. They talk and pray and agonize. Countless hours are spent in conference and consultation on planning and pleading, and most of it is done without so much as a thank you. They are the first to be criticized and the last to be praised. When things are going well, elders praise the preacher and the people, and during the decline they suffer the stings and arrows of the critics in silence. They are called upon daily to make decisions which are difficult and many times unpopular to some of the congregation. Actions which often seem mystifying could be uh, readily explained if they are willing to break a confidence and tell it like it is. But rather than see any member suffer, elders frequently take abuse with offering any defense. If any men in the world are deserving of our support and love and appreciation and cooperation, the elders should have it. And I say amen to that because I agree with what this man said. We do not know what our great elders here go through. And I know a few years ago before we got here that you guys went through a very, very difficult, difficult times. One of the things that impressed me most when I sat down in the meeting with the elders when I was being interviewed was how they came together and how they kept this congregation together. And I said, that's the congregation that I want to be a minister over if they will hire me. It's a beautiful thing when you have elders united in the truth. In the truth. It's a beautiful thing. We need to love them. We need to support them. And we need to thank them. We need to often pray for them. For what they do and what they represent. How they fulfill their duties and responsibilities. What God expects of them here at Ripon. 
because the elders watch over our souls. They love, I know they love each and every member here of this congregation. And they rule so they can make sure that our souls are watched over. And we could serve with them and help them instead of striving against them and being critical of their decisions. I'm not saying anybody does that. Let's not do that. Of course, we're going to, at times, we're not going to agree on everything. Sometimes there may be a disagreement. But out of love, then we talk about that. There's, there's other things I did not cover, but uh, I think what I cover tonight, I think that gives us all uh, a good, re, you know, it, it reminds us and reminds us um, uh, the responsibilities that we have and the responsibilities that our elders have here. And so um, the uh, invitations uh, always offered, and if um, you need a prayer, you could come up and we could pray together. If you need to be baptized into Christ, uh, do not hesitate. Uh, come now as we stand and we sing the invitation song.